Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to answer a question from a subscriber. Uh, Central Origin asked the question, would you recommend different resources for different levels of intellect, i.e. for those that are not as smart uh, as others, would you suggest a more forgiving textbook, or would you say there exists a certain minimum threshold to be useful in your industry, and that it may not be the career choice for them if they're struggling more than some people who are more mathematically talented? Okay, so to answer this question, I'm going to answer it kind of to the question and kind of in a different way. Uh, so one, I'm going to answer kind of the smartness level and textbooks and things. Uh, I do think different textbooks teach things at different levels. Um, realistically, education is like a jawbreaker. Um, so if you've seen a jawbreaker, right, it has like a core that's one color. And then there's like another layer around it, but it's a different color. And there's all these different layers that make up the jawbreaker. Typically, when you go through like high school, you go through graduate school, undergrad and all that stuff, right? You start off like in high school with this little ball that's like the core of the jawbreaker. And you learn um, a lot of things. Like you learn, you know, calculus probably and algebra. And you learn things like, I don't know, English and spelling and basic arithmetic. And you learn, you know, sciences like, I don't know, chemistry and biology and all that, right? And that's, each one of those can be viewed kind of like the first layer of a jawbreaker. And then when you go to like college, for example, and you get your bachelor's, um, if you've done biology, for example, in high school and you take biology in college, it's typically like now a little layer on the outside of the core. And then if you were to take, you know, a few more classes in undergrad, you add maybe a few more layers. And then you go and say you get a master's in biology. And now all of a sudden there are like a few more layers on top of that. And then you go and you get a PhD in biology again and then you add more layers and realistically that ball say is like 100 to 200 layers thick by the time you get a phd you might be at like 10 layers right so you're not very far um 10 layers though is pretty thick compared to somebody who has either no layers or just a core and so a lot of times i think people start checking things off which really irritates me and it irritates a lot of people in like the academic communities and even in like very technical fields all over. So like sciences, you know, arts and everything is that just because you learn, for example, like calculus, and then you go and you take like some more advanced calculus, like ODEs and PDEs, and you do some other things like that, like real analysis, and you start adding a little more to it. And then grad school, you take stochastic calculus. And then you think like, oh, I've checked all these boxes, I've done all this stuff, I'm done, right? It's not really like that. There's all these extra layers of things that you can still learn that add more detail and more information. And you can make that basically that jawbreaker. You can make it thicker and thicker and thicker if you really spend the time on doing it. And I think this is where a lot of people, I don't know where the disconnect is, but you get a PhD, right? And a lot of you end up going to teach. And then you do a bunch of research. And as you're doing research, you're basically learning more and more and more and more about this topic. And you're at the point a lot of times that you're adding new value to that field. So, you know, you, maybe you're doing some crazy topic that, you know, no one's really looked at before. Maybe you're putting it in a new light or you're stretching it across, you know, different types of academic communities and you're, you know, tapping into different people and you're making your jawbreaker thicker and thicker and thicker. And realistically, by the time you're at the end of your career and you're old and retired as a professor, you have this really, really thick jawbreaker. Um, careers are the same way. And... One big thing I do a lot of is, for example, time series. And when we work in quantitative finance, a lot of times we're kind of doing different topics. And this is true of every educational endeavor. Um, so you might have like 30 jawbreakers, for example, right? You have 30 different topics. You have like, I don't know, mathematics and statistics and, you know, computer programming in C and computer programming in MATLAB and computer programming in SAS and Java and Python. And then you have all these hobbies maybe on the side that interest you. So you have a bunch of different types of physics and you have all these other sciences, like you love geology. But in general, you have all these different job breakers and all these different job breakers you need to add layers to. And a lot of times, more or less, you can think of like a spider web connecting all the job breakers because realistically, different layers of different job breakers are going to overlap with each other. And so some mathematics that you learned in your pure mathematical theory class is going to apply to something that's learned in your statistics class, which is gonna to apply to something in your finance course, which applies to something in your economics course. And pretty soon you're tying all these things together and you're building this really big, massive cluster of jawbreakers. So to answer your question in general, I don't think it really matters how smart you are in a sense. I think anyone can do it if you put in the time and the effort and the desire. But I think the biggest mistake is people think like, 
I'm gonna check all these minimum boxes and when I do this, I'm gonna be really good at something. But what you don't realize is in the real world, there's people that actually like doing that and you might not like it, but they love it. And so on their weekends and their free time, they're out there like building these jaw breakers bigger and bigger because they're so excited. Where if you're doing the same thing and you're trying to build your jaw breaker on the same topics, it's gonna be slower for you because you just don't enjoy it. And every weekend and every time after work when you're grinding in trying to do this, it's gonna be miserable and eventually you're gonna give up most likely, or if not, you're gonna live a pretty terrible life doing something you absolutely hate your entire life. So yeah, I think you have to build things layer and layer. To add into the textbook comments now, yes, I think there are different textbooks at different layers. I think you have to start at the bottom and work your way up, but I don't think necessarily some textbooks are very good textbooks because I think a lot of academics write things as archaically and mathematical and complex as possible with the sole purpose of showing the world, I am really great, I am really smart, um, but realistically I can't teach and I can't explain this to anybody and I'm very insecure. So I'm gonna give you guys some examples here a little bit and show you some little flavors and kind of different aspects of, I guess, adding to the layers. Okay, so to start off with, this is my favorite textbook. A lot of you know this. I talk about this book constantly. It's Statistical Analysis of Financial Data in S+. Plus. There's an R version because R is the you know language that was built from S+. Plus. Um, but I love this book. This book covers a ton of different topics at a ton of different levels. Um, it covers some time series. Just a little bit. So time series is gonna be the job breaker we're building here. So realistically, you need basic stats to even get to this book. So I'd recommend you take like an intro stats class or you watch a bunch of stats videos, learn OLS and all that. And that might be more or less what you started with when you start with this book, which is another book that I usually recommend. And this is, you know, Introductory Econometrics, A Modern Approach, fifth edition. Doesn't really matter the edition, I don't think. Um, but it's by Jeffrey Waldridge, who's actually a very well-known author as well as the author on this book, who's Renee Carmona. But this book is gonna teach you a lot of random things as well. This is gonna focus more on like stats. So it's stats applied to econ, you do like OLS, you talk about you know all these assumptions. This book I think is really excellent in the fact that it builds a lot layer by layer within the book. This book is pretty thick. I think you could use this book for multiple classes and still be learning new stuff every time you take a new class um, on a different section of the book. But going back to the time series here, this will give you a lot of the base understanding of general stats. And then in the back of here in the blue section, this is like advanced topics, covers more on time series. Um, this book is more on time series as well, but it's focused towards finance specifically. And it covers a lot of other topics in general. So these two books should be able to build you enough for the core and then maybe a few layers. So let's say one or two layers here. And then you might go on to do other things. I think academic papers are one of the best resources. I know it sounds crazy to read academic papers, but when people reference like I'm using X method and like I think this and this and there's a website on it, whatever, I usually don't take you very seriously. I go in and I look up all the academic papers and I tried to read them and a lot of them will actually be clearly written in plain English um, that explain a lot of the material. But again, having these books will help you with the jargon uh, it will get you to that level where well-written papers at an advanced level are still easy to understand. Now this book is a huge thick book and this book is on time series. Um, it's by Hamilton. It's used by a lot of academic institutions, but this book is written almost purely, I would say, in math. So it does a decent job at explaining the English, but in terms I don't think it's written as well as you know these two books, right? But part of it is that the other two books are written for a lower level information and criteria. So when you start getting up to higher and higher books, a lot of times it's A, the material is challenging and it's hard to explain, but it was written very well. You just need all the inner layers of your jawbreaker. Or it can be that it was written so poorly and so archaically in an academic setting, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'm going to let you in on a secret here. Most textbooks are written pretty terribly because most people writing them aren't those that are very good teachers. They're just looking to make extra money. Um, they're looking to advance their careers. And so they write pretty terrible textbooks. Um, these three books are examples of how you would have to layer them. Like, I don't think it would be possible for you just to dive into this book and just start building models and reading this and just knowing everything. You really do need other books to kind of lay the foundation to get to that point. All right, so now answering the second part of this, which is, you know, on the smartness, intelligence, different levels, 
textbooks, yes, I agree with that. And then they also mentioned, or would you say there's a certain minimum threshold to be useful in your industry and that it may not be the career choice for them if they struggle more than someone um, who's more mathematically talented? So to answer this, I don't think it's a layers or a pure intellect thing. I think it's gonna be, like I mentioned before, you're gonna have to build layers but at the same time, some people don't like math, okay? Just plain and simple. It doesn't matter how many math classes they take. It doesn't matter how good you are at math. And for any topic in general, right? It might be programming. Maybe you hate to program. That's just, right? That's just who you are. Maybe you love geology, for example, or maybe you love writing books, or maybe you love doing woodworking or plumbing or electrical. Right? There's all these cool things out there that you can do for a career. There's nothing in here that should tell you you have to do math. And so to answer this, I think that people that don't enjoy it, there's not some like satisfaction from doing it. You're just not gonna do as well in a career. And I do think there's a minimum threshold to be in our industry. Um, yes, you can get a job and yes, you can work in the industry and you could be a complete idiot. I mean, it happens. People slip through the cracks, they know somebody, they get a job, they build a career, but in general, they don't add a lot of value to the industry. They don't add a lot of value to their projects. People know who they are because they just don't perform very well. And a lot of it just comes back to the fact that you don't necessarily enjoy doing what you're doing. Um, culturally, there are some cultures that prefer specific skills over other skills. Um, I give you a thumbs down. I think that's a pretty terrible culture in general across all cultures that do this. Um, I understand people want your kids or grandkids or your society or whatever to be very successful. And I wave my hands at it because Success can be defined in very different ways. Um, a lot of you don't know, I don't think, but I have another YouTube channel where I do um, like handy videos. So I rebuild car engines, for example. I do my own auto repairs for almost everything I have. Um, I build wood furniture in my free time for fun. You know, I do all my own septic. I mow my own grass. Um, I actually enjoy doing it, right? I love doing it. I actually worked blue collar doing construction and manufacturing for a few years. I enjoyed doing it, but the thing was I ended up choosing a different career path and a different route. Um, now, would I ever look down if I ended up saying that I didn't want to be in finance, I wanted to be an electrician, for example? No, as long as I'm making money and I'm happy, right? That's something that you should do. So to answer this question in general, you have the analogy I gave you with the job breakers. Yes, everything's built in layers. Um, don't check boxes and think you've taken one class on one topic, so therefore you know it. Um, you need to build all these layers in each topic and then put them all together. Um, the second part is yes, to work in any industry, you need a minimum competency in that area. Um, so I don't know, pick some topic that you've never done. Like let's just pick automotive because I was talking about that. Let's say you're the world's greatest quant and you can build and develop all these crazy models and you make great money. At the end of the day, you know, you go to work on a car or fix something and you just can't do it and you break everything. It's not that you're dumb. It's just that that's not a skill you have. And so going back to Adam Smith and economics here, uh, and a lot of my, you know, Austrian economic perspective, it's best to focus and specialize a lot of times in one thing that you're really good at and you really enjoy, make a successful career, and then things that you can't do or you don't want to do or you don't like, you pay someone else to do it that actually enjoys doing it. So anyways, I hope that answers your question in more detail. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.